if you're thinking about buying a house, then I think now's a great time. Uh, if you're looking to sell, then uh, I do it ASAP because we're starting to get into the depths of summer, which is when listings start to get stale and hit sit on the market for a little bit longer. Because everyone wants to be yeah. here. Yeah. Quick little update for you. We were here like a year ago. I saw a, this is not a little rumor. Update. This is a huge. This is a huge update. I saw a rumor like a year ago that they were putting a Trader Joe's in Greenwood. This is the biggest news since the Met and Crown Hill. Yeah, true, market. true. Um, and it turns out that it's true. It's all over uh, all the real news outlets. Real. So in the uh, the old Safeway place, they are putting a Trader Joe's on the ground level, and very excited about that. I don't know why, I mean, we don't live here. The Shoreline one is probably closer to our house. Well, you've heard us like tout the glories of Greenwood as one of our favorite neighborhoods. And I just, I didn't think it could get better, but it did, it just did. So it's been like a week and a half since we've given an update, right? Yeah, it has. Well, I think we're not, we haven't, we are a little late on our update because you got sick. Oh yeah, I guess so. You just weren't up for filming. Yeah, that's true. But we're better now. And it's and gonna, look at the sun. It's gonna look be at the high beach. of seventy nine today. We're at Carkeek Park in Greenwood. We went to Coffee Holic, uh, which is one of my favorite spots for Vietnamese coffee. Oh, there's an eagle. Oh my gosh, it's majestic here. That's huge. <laughs> so, what has been going on? Let's see. We had a closing since the last video. Um, the uh, friends that we helped with the sewer repair and everything, they're officially closed and now we're working on listing their condo. Yeah, we can't, I, I don't know, it might be interesting to talk a little bit about, about what goes into preparing a listing. Yeah. Um, a lot of it is on the homeowner, getting things fixed. Um, yeah, just repairs, clean. Yeah, I, I always help with that a little bit. Um, you were like pressure scheduling washing. Scheduling vendors. Uh, these are good friends of ours, so yeah. I, yeah, that was kind I of did a special. Some patch and paint. Uh, I bought a pressure washer. I'm excited to justify that cost. When you've been friends since you're 18, you have to at least get yeah. the pressure washer out for the <laughs> patio. But yeah, it can be a lot of work, especially for bigger houses. Um, and you can do as much or as little work as you want. It's not like you have to fix everything um, to go on and the market. And I really want to be like like posting all about this and like oh look at my pressure washer and i'm doing this patio but i'm limited as a realtor i can't uh pre-advertise that's what the nw mls says uh, that's a rule and they're pretty strict about it they're like on social media looking at realtors accounts and yep. finding people for yep. pre-advertising you cannot advertise a listing before it is live on the market and it might be kind of confusing because if you follow people in other markets for example uh, you might see people say oh i have this listing coming soon make sure you check it out you know when it goes live next week um, other markets you can do that but here in our area we cannot so are we pre-advertising right now no, we're not saying. I mean, we're not saying the location, location the size, price, price anything. anything. Just you know, stay tuned in the next couple of weeks and stay tuned. There's a listing somewhere. Somewhere <laughs> in this region. <laughs> <laughs> we also always recommend um, staging, and let me make sure that we're recording. Okay. We always, always recommend staging, no matter the price point. I, th mm, I think sometimes yeah. when you're looking around at listings, you'll notice that maybe lower price points aren't staged. Um, as often as the higher price points, but for us, we feel it makes a huge difference in the ultimate um, price you're going to get for your Yeah, because a lot listing. of those lower price listings, they sit on the market for a while too. Um, right. It's part of the reason. Yeah, but staging can really make or break it. So we're getting that all set up for this listing. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're wondering, uh, what's the cost on uh, the staging here? Yeah, you know, it, it can vary. I would say for like a small, uh, you know, under a thousand square feet, maybe two bedroom type of place, you're looking at minimum 2,000, between two and 3,000. Mm -hmm. And then for a bigger house, it could be upwards of five or 6,000 yeah, or like more. We, we paid 5,000 once for a big. We staged a big home, um, you know, and, and I think we only staged the primary bedroom in that home, not the yeah. other three yeah. bedrooms. Um, and that was 5,000 and change. Um, that's something we cover though for our sellers mm -hmm. um, be because we feel so strongly that it's necessary. We do not want 
money to be a, a roadblock uh, in having that done. Yeah, because so. I think it's ultimately it's going to be one of the biggest things that affects the sales price, and we want to sell it for as high as possible for our yeah. clients. And well, you know, we make that back in commission, to be honest. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's exciting. That's coming up. Mm-hmm. What mm-hmm. else? Um, let's see, I got a house under contract. Uh, we got our house under contract. Uh, it was all you. Yeah, just say we. <laughs> <laughs> since the, uh, the last time that we checked in. Mm. Uh, this is the parents of somebody that I helped buy a couple months ago. Uh, so it was very exciting to get the whole family together. Uh, it's uh, kind of a good indicator of how the market's going based on uh, negotiations for this one though when I helped their kids uh, you know it was a little bit different market you know it was a bigger house in a uh, in Ravenna desirable neighborhood and it took a while and this one's in our neighborhood yeah <laughs> The desirable the way, you, the house. way you said that was funny. <laughs> I think our neighborhood's desirable. I think so, yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, a couple months ago, multiple offers, super competitive. And then uh, last week, it was we were the only offer. We were able to negotiate uh, cleaning out the sewer line, another sewer repair, uh, and a small credit to do some repairs after closing. Yeah, and this one's a little interesting. I wanted to mention, um, we won't talk too much about it, um, but their uh, financing was kind of interesting Mm, for this one. I believe they're using um, a family opportunity loan. Yeah, which is pretty cool. Um, We've done this a couple times before. Uh, You can buy a house for a family member and um, you can get a conventional mortgage. You can do a low down payment. it's uh, pretty great. Instead of like getting a second home or an investment property or something like that, which has uh, stricter requirements and higher interest rates. Yeah, you always need to put 20% down for um, second homes, investment properties. Um, but this is sort of um, a situation where you, you don't have to with these special loans. And um, we, we don't talk about, we, we are fairly well versed in financing options, but stuff is changing all the time. So while we do it's important for us to stay up to date and we can kind of point you all in the right direction. We always refer you to um, our, our lender um, rather than getting really into the specifics of the different types of loan products because that's just not our specialty. That's what we have partners for. Yeah, that's what I had a phone call uh, yesterday or the day before. Um, somebody reached out asking, you know, they said, oh, I make this much money um, looking to buy my first house. What do you think? Um, you know, I'm able to give like a, a rough like, oh, yeah, I think you could apply for some down payment assistance programs. But then I send them to uh, my favorite lender, Julie Johnson. She is great, and she's always up on all of the programs, which are, um, you know, cycling in and out. They're expiring. Uh, there's new programs, uh, so you know she's super educated on all of that and is able to drive people in the right direction. She's always linked below. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and if you if you are um, thinking about buying in the near future, usually we say the first place to stop is to chat with Alex. Um, and then he points you over to Julie just to really get a grip on what you're able to do or if there's any special products like the family opportunity loan um, that could work for you. So yeah. that's that's how that goes down. Yeah. But it's kind of, I'm jealous. I'm jealous that these guys have their, they think they have a kid about the same age as Celie. And mm-hmm. I'm really jealous that their parents are moving I know. to town. Yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> You know, I saw an interesting article in the Seattle Times mm. um, about millionaires in Seattle. Well, you saw that because we were we did a Mott Lake neighborhood tour, oh, yeah. which will link, um, which is one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in Seattle. So I think when we were researching that, you saw this stat <laughs> yeah. that blew my mind. Yeah. Uh, so if you haven't seen this, one in 14 people in Seattle are millionaires. Not just millionaires, liquid millionaires. Let that sink in. Yeah, that's crazy. What does liquid mean? I mean, I know what liquid means cash. Is it anything beyond cash? Uh, cash and stocks. So anything that takes um, just a couple days to, to access. So like real estate would not be liquid because it takes months to get any money out of it. One in 14 people are liquid millionaires in Seattle. Wow. There's just, a lot of money in Seattle. It really doesn't feel like we should have some of the problems that we have. I know, but this no. is in a political channel, so I'll, I won't go there right now. <laughs> oh, wow, that's crazy. And it's, interested, it's interesting that the definition of liquid, and that makes total sense, money that you can access quickly. We were just talking with the financial advisor recently. And for our personal investments, we're kind of we're more interested in real estate because we know it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he 
tends to put that in a riskier bucket when you're thinking about the buckets of different investments because it's not uh, uh, it's not money that you can access quickly. It's not um, liquid. Yeah, it's not liquid. Um, so I think that's interesting. And I think that is part of why people see it as a riskier investment when you're just talking about real estate investing, which makes perfect sense. But at the same time for us, it's like the least risky investment because we are so familiar with the asset. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're in the industry. We know exactly how it works and the ebbs and flows of the market. Which is why we need to get back in there and investing. I know. Yeah, we're actually um, hunting right now for uh, like a duplex that we can own as an investment property, as a rental. Uh, which, you know, I've been seeing on social media all over the place, like the, uh, the demonization of landlords. And um, I, I mean, maybe this is a hot take, but I just don't agree. Uh, to some degree, there's like slum lords who are, uh, who are bad and uh, take advantage of people. But uh, we really believe in the mom and pop landlord because not everybody wants to buy a house. Not everybody is able to buy a house. And um, you know, there should be like small little rental houses out there on the marketplace that are available for people. Or big rental houses. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. we need uh, it in every price point. We need rental inventory. Mm -hmm. um, I've even seen some like social media influencers saying that they're like not going to be investing in real estate anymore because um, you know they don't want to take homes that people would otherwise buy for their primary residence. Fine. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I talked about this uh, yesterday. I was on a podcast yesterday, recorded Ooh, a podcast fancy. with a uh, local uh, social media influencer, Emma's Edition. Um, it'll come out in a couple of weeks. Maybe I'll uh, post about it when it does. Um, but, uh, you know, she asked why I got into real estate. And, um, you know, I realized that uh, part of it was because there's this long history. I was in the arts at the time. Uh, I still consider myself an artist, but. You uh, are. Um, I was in the arts and there's this long standing history tradition of artists supplementing their uh, very minimal art income through real estate. Um, like in LA in the uh, 50s and 60s, there's a lot of artists who are buying real estate, commercial, residential, uh, and then renting it out. And that's the only way that they're able to afford to have a, uh, an art career. And like a lot of the minimalist, famous artists, uh, they, uh, they supported their career this way. It also makes a lot of sense because so many artists are hands-on people. I mean, mm -hmm. you're the perfect example. Like you have the skills or at least the ability to figure out how to get the skills you needed to be super hands-on with a real estate investment and do DIY flips and such. And that's, that's yeah, that's the original reason you got into real estate was mm -hmm. to do that and supplement. Yeah, so we're looking for a duplex. I think duplexes are great. Um, they sit on the market for a little bit longer because most uh, like primary homeowners aren't interested in purchasing them. So, you know, they, they generally go to real estate investors. And, um, uh, and I think that uh, it'll be fun to look for one. But I finally convinced Alex that we do need to look a little bit further out from Seattle. We, we kind of got all our financing in order a few months ago. We got pre-approved for our loan. We got a HELOC um, home equity line of credit open on our house in case we wanted to use that equity for the purchase. I don't think we will because rates on that are really high right now. Yeah. Um, but you never know. So we, we have got all our ducks in a row and I feel like it's been a battle of like, where, where are we I'm, gonna look? <laughs> I'm of the opinion that uh, like appreciation is the, uh, the best investment strategy in a major metropolitan area like Seattle. Uh, so, you know, maybe you don't make very much cash flow uh, while you're any. owning the place, but <laughs> in uh, 30 years, uh, this house is going to double, triple in value and uh, you sell it in the end and uh, that's when you uh, yeah. pay off on the investment. And I'm, I'm a lot more risk averse and that I don't want to be losing money every month. Um, I'm kind of at the place now where if we are in the red a little bit, a little bit every month, that would be okay because mm -hmm. that's the, because we're gaining that long-term appreciation, I'm willing to make that cash flow sacrifice. If, it'd be better if we don't have to do that. But anyways, I think the point is that we're kind of meeting in the middle. We are looking at markets further outside of Seattle, but I think there kind of are some hotter markets. I don't mm -hmm. think we would go as far as like 
Eastern Washington at this point, and we're like Arlington, Oak Harbor. Yeah, we uh, are not out of state yeah, investors. I don't think we ever will be, but maybe. All right, so another transaction. Uh, this little condo house that we mm-hmm. that we listed a couple months ago. Uh, we're nearing the closing date. We're under contract. But there's a buyer, and uh, we're like a week from a week away from closing right now. And it's been kind of stressful because. Uh, paperwork because of paperwork uh, we have this survey that we need completed and the surveyors being just uh, they're perfectly pleasant but they're very slow they're not on the same like time is of the essence as we are I think the stressful thing from our perspective obviously is that we want to make sure the transaction goes through for our seller but the stuff that uh, I think a good real estate agent shields buyers and sellers from are all the other people involved in the transaction. Mm-hmm. And our seller is having to be super involved with like the attorney and the surveyor because he's the person that needs to be signing. He needs to know so the he's doing, everything. But there's like, there's like title companies and escrow officers and lenders that uh, that don't want to be blamed <laughs> yeah. if if we close late or if we have a delay. And so they're just really intense. <laughs> like emailing every day, calling like, you know, we, we can't make this deadline unless we have this by this time. And, you know, buyer and seller are all aware of that. But I think it comes down to like people not being, yeah. wanting to be blamed. Yeah. There's like frenzy behind the scenes that I think, like, it's a fine. A big but. part of my job as a real estate agent is just like managing expectations, emotions, and people. Uh, so like I can't I can't help with the the survey company with the notary uh, like the seller has to do all of this and uh, I want to help but um, what I can do is just make sure that everybody's updated everybody's cool level-headed communication and yeah it's just uh, the lines of communication are open uh, what's been going on at home uh, oh I've been uh, our fence blew down our fence, right? blew yeah, down. our fence blew down. Uh, we had a big windstorm, and I've been spending the past like week rebuilding it. I don't know how to rebuild a fence, but uh, you know, I watched a lot of YouTube videos, and it's coming all right. It looks really good. No, it looks really good, and I think, um, you know, it wouldn't have taken us long to figure out how much fence companies cost by getting a few bids. But we've been in the real estate industry long enough and watched clients replace fences long enough to know that we didn't even need to bother getting bids we wanted to build it ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that costing like $1,500. And I actually get this question a lot, uh, $1,500 in supplies. Um, For just a portion of our backyard, yeah, a big stretch, like, but like yeah. um, 20 feet it was. It was 55 feet. Okay. Uh, so I get this question a lot from clients, um, like they're, we're looking at a house that they potentially want to buy and uh, maybe it needs fencing or uh, the fencing needs to be replaced and they're like, oh, who pays for that? How does that happen? Uh, and uh, the vast majority of fences are built right on the property line. Uh, oftentimes, uh, there's a survey that's done in order to establish that, uh, sometimes not. Uh, but I'd say the vast majority of fences are built on the property line, uh, which means that it's a shared expense. Uh, so, you know, uh, we don't know these neighbors that well, but uh, we know them a lot better now because we our wandered out joined. there and they <laughs> wandered out because the fence had fallen down and we met. <laughs> uh, yeah, and like I just came up with a budget. I shopped online at Home Depot, came up with $1,500. I said, hey, do you want to split this cost? To give you an idea, I think if we had gotten in bids, this 55 feet would have cost like five to seven thousand dollars so it's a big savings and i gotta learn something new okay back to believing in mom and pop landlords Mm. um uh, we started a property management company because we do believe this and we get uh questions from clients about um maybe renting out their uh their first house that they bought in order to upgrade um that's what we're uh managing one little townhouse in west yellow right now Uh, it's gone very smoothly but i'm hoping this couple move here. Uh, We're looking for a rental for them so that they can get to know the city and then buy eventually. Uh, And just the like the vast majority of property managers are pretty terrible. They work, it's interesting because it's the real estate industry, Mm -hmm. but they work at a very different pace. Yeah. And we've had some pretty candid conversations with um, a friend of ours who's in the industry and 
and it's just a different communication style. And to be honest, like real estate sales is a different communication style than previous industries that I've been in. Like I used to work in a university setting and and you kind of had your ducks in a row before you responded. Um, I don't even know if that's the best way to say it. The point is just that our industry is super fast. Like you want responses right away or you want to know that someone is working on getting a response. Yeah. And property managers don't work that way. Oh, and we work on weekends, by the way. And <laughs> these yeah. guys don't. And evenings. Uh, which, is, which is fine. That's like normal industries don't do that. But, you know, we're used to being able to get answers for clients ASAP, even over the weekend. And it's like, oh, you know, oh, it's the weekend, we can't schedule stuff. I was trying to put together a tour. They were flying into town. I wanted to put together a tour of houses so that we could go look at a couple of options. And um, it was so difficult. It took like a week and a half. A uh, couple of people canceled, uh, moved, and we ended up looking at like Or they only places. respond through Zillow. Yeah. You're, you're relying on Zillow for communication. Yeah. Um, we, we, in helping renters, we do have the advantage of being able to access rental listings on the MLS. Mm -hmm. um, but around here, there aren't too many. It is definitely worth looking. There are some, especially higher price points, I would yeah. say. Yeah. Like, you know, bigger houses, people will list that on the MLS. Um, but it's not like Manhattan where these listings are all, you know, you need a real estate agent to find uh, rental properties. But if you're moving from out of state, it is really helpful to have uh, boots on the ground. I think one of our dreams for this little property management company, like big dream down the road, would be, you know, we're helping people move from out of state. We know they want to rent for a year or two, um, but we have this network of our previous clients who are now yeah. good landlords that we help manage their property. And we're able to maybe even just like place these people without having to go on a big, a big hunt in mm -hmm. like a place that we are super familiar with because maybe we helped that person buy that home originally. Yeah. Um, and just kind of like make connections that way. That's like the big dream. I don't, I don't know. You'd have to kind of really get to volume to make that happen, but that'd be so cool. Yeah, I think that'd be really cool. Uh, we had somebody reach out a couple of days ago um, looking to find a property manager for their condo in Kirkland. We're still figuring out the property management thing. Um, we have um, someone on our team helping us, which is really great. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. So if you're looking to make a home in Seattle, Send us a message. Let's work together. Bye.